Hello, American Prestige listeners. It's Derek. I'm joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, Danny Bessner. Uh, and we're very grateful to welcome to the program today Mohammed Hera Omer, a researcher and writer based in Oslo, Norway, and former member of the Eritrean Liberation Front, who has written a piece for foreign policy called Are Ethiopia and Eritrea on the Path to War? I feel like this is a uh, region and a conflict that we have uh, not done enough to cover. So very glad to have Mohammed here to help us. Uh, Mohammed, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thanks for inviting me. So why don't we just start with, we'll obviously have a link to your piece in the, the show notes so people can check it out for themselves. But why don't we just start with a basic overview of uh, the thesis here? Why, do you, uh, why are you contending that Ethiopia and Eritrea are uh, on the path to another conflict? Uh, I think it is uh, important to have just uh, a little bit of a brief historical background. Um, we love historical background here, and it doesn't have to be brief. <laughs> so, because if you look at the Horn of Africa in general, which uh, encompasses Eritrea, Ethiopia, uh, Somalia, Djibouti, parts of Sudan, and sometimes South Sudan also, this region has been married with conflicts. And in the last uh, 30 years, it has uh, two new states have re-emerged and another new state, South Sudan, has come into existence just in the last uh, 30 years or, or, or so. Uh, like, it seems like this region, the state formations, the state configurations, the borders are not complete yet. For example, Eritrea won its independence after 30 years war with um, with Ethiopia. Uh, Eritrea was an Italian colony from 1890 to 1941, and then during World War II, and the Allied forces won over uh, Italy in 1941. So the British forces occupied Eritrea from 1941 to 1952. So this was an interim period, and it was a, not an occupation, but the British run uh, Eritrea as an interim administration. And uh, the international community, there were three um, colonists from of Italy in Africa. That was Libya, Italian Somaliland, and Eritrea. And there were deliberations in how to do with these Italian colonies. And uh, there was agreement on Libya and Somalia, but there was no that they could be independent. But there was no agreement on Eritrea. So um, it was taken by the great powers. There was a commission who came to Eritrea to see the people's um, wishes or what they w would like to see. And they couldn't come into an agreement. And then it was taken into the United Nations. And then in 19, to make the story short, in 1952, it was federated with Ethiopia. So... Uh, but the federation was um, a little bit uh, different. It was the first time of federation in Africa, actually, uh, uh, such a federation. But the federation, there was no a federal state. So the federal state was represented by Ethiopia itself. So Ethiopia was part of this federation, and it was also this federal uh, state. So... Eritrea at that time had its own constitution based on United Nations uh, principles. Uh, it has an assembly. There were elections. And while Ethiopia was an imperial authority, uh, there was no freedom of press, no, const no uh, particular uh, constitution with all uh, provisions for, for all the rights. And so this was a bad start for the uh, federation. So Eritrea has about had about 10 political parties during that period. And uh, as I said, it had its own constitution, it has its own assembly, and it has run elections, maybe one of the first elections in, in uh, Africa at that time. And uh, it could have been independent in 1952, but there was no agreement inside Eritrea. The highland of Eritrea is more linked to Ethiopia, 
and the lowlands are more linked to Sudan. So the British tried to divide it between, between Ethiopia and uh, Sudan. The people rejected this. And finally, there was this um, uh, federation. But Ethiopia started gradually uh, destroying this federation step by step. They took away the Eritrean flag, um, all the Eritrean rights, the freedoms, the freedom of press, expression, etc. And in 1962, they annexed it as part of the 14th province of Ethiopia. So this is how the conflict starts. And so in 1961, Eritreans waged, after uh, exhausting all possible peaceful means, they result, they uh, waged an armed struggle in 1961 to liberate themselves from Ethiopia, which they saw as a colonial power. And this war went on for 30 years. It was a very devastating war. And in 1991, Eritrea became free, uh, an independent state. In 1993, it became a member of the World Nations after a referendum, which by 97% Eritreans voted that they wanted to be an independent state. And during this period, also there was another uh, liberation front in Tigray, uh, the, the, the um, south of uh, Eritrea. And also the First it was the ELF, then the EPLF dominated, and then the EPLF and TPLF agreed that Eritrea could be independent. And so in 1991, uh, Eritrea became independent. Eritreans controlled Eritrea, and also the TPLF controlled Ethiopia, and they formed an, an interim government. Uh, and uh, they were in good terms the first few years, and then disputed starts on economic uh, issue, on border issue, because they were not uh, demarcated. So in 1998, they went into war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Particularly, it was a war between Eritrea and the TPLS, which controlled Ethiopia through uh, an umbrella of four organizations called the EPRDF, uh, Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. And this war was devastating for 21, for two years until 2000. Something like 100,000 people died during this war. And then there was an agreement uh, with um, interaction of Algeria. And so they signed the Algeria's agreement and they uh, agreed to form a border commission between them, a boundary commission. So it was taken to the International Court of Justice. And uh, they then came the ruling in um, 2002. Uh, Ethiopia reluctantly ag agreed to the um, to the provisions of the war boundary commission, and uh, so the, the uh, relations were strained between Eritrea and Ethiopia, and essentially it was actually between Eritrea and the Tigray People's Liberation Front, and this continued until 2018, and then Abiy Ahmed took power in uh, 2018. He started dismantling the deep state of the Tigray Liberation Front, the TPLF in Ethiopia, and he promised reforms, uh, a lot of reforms, freeing political prisoners, and called on all opposition groups. Uh, something like 10 of them were in Eritrea, returned back to Ethiopia. He promised to open the political space for all. And uh, there was euphoria in Ethiopia. I mean, uh, Ethiopia will be a democratic country. And because of this, and then he also agreed to the border ruling uh, of the Boundary Commission. And uh, so the relations improved between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Uh, and there was, uh, borders were open for some time. Flights were reopened. Telephone lines were uh, opened between these two countries and the people could move from one country to another. So this was a euphoria. And uh, Abiy Ahmed then won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019, basically for uh, ending this conflict between Eritrea and Ethiopia. But in hand side, it, it so, and they agreed on certain uh, agreements that were signed between, but the agreements were mainly between ECS as an Eritrean dictator and Abi Ahmed as the prime minister of Ethiopia, as they were not presented to the parliament. Maybe uh, before we get into the further development of the, the 2018 peace deal and, and how it 
uh, started to falter. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Isaiah's, uh, Isaiah's uh, Afwerki and, and his, where does he come from, the other party in this uh, back and forth? Maybe just a little bit of, of kind of historical background on him specifically would be helpful to, to contextualize. Yeah, in uh, actually, Isaiah's uh, Afwerki, the, the, the first front to start with was the Eritrean Liberation Front that started in 1961. So he joined the Eritrean Liberation Front in 1967. Within a few months, he went on training. The ELF sent him for training to China with uh, five mem other members. So they took their military training and uh, political uh, training in China. And he returned back in 1968. And from the start, he was keen on forming his own organization. Uh, Isias, as a, as a person, we have written a, a long article about him, had, um, was very ambitious as a person to start with, even in his childhood. And he wouldn't accept even being second to, to, to none. Even in his, uh, he, he comes from a big family, about eight um, siblings. But uh, when it was dinner time or something, he would take the best chair available. And uh, one time, even in high school, he slapped his uh, Episcop teacher in physics and he gave him a bad mark. So he slapped his um, teacher because he gave him a bad mark. So he was always known for this. And then there were like uh, football teams in the surroundings uh, when he was young. And he would like to be the, the, the leader of all the teams in the surrounding, two, three, or something. So he always opted to. So in the ELF, uh, I think the ELF was not enough for him. So he wanted to form just not being a member of a leadership. He wanted to have his own organizations. So he split from the ELF in 1971 on, uh, on agenda claiming that the ELF was persecuting Christians and they have been persecuted and so on. So he was like, in defense of the Christians in the Eritrean Liberation Front. And uh, with that, he got a support. So most, uh, some of the Highland groups joined uh, him. And uh, he faced it actually in 19, um, in 1972, uh, some of his group with him in the, in the new organization. It was called uh, the PLF, uh, Popular Liberation Front challenging him because there was no democracy in his organization. They wanted accountability and so on. And he, after some time, he arrested all of them and the ringleaders were executed. So he consolidated his power in the organization that he created. And then he formed something called the Guardians of the Revolution which was a notorious um, security apparatus through which he was able to, to control this organization. Gradually also, they formed a clandestine Marxist party. They called it People's Revolutionary Party. And also through this party, he was able to consolidate his power. Uh, so there will be one person watching over two or three persons and reporting about them and so on, the party members. So through that, he consolidated his power. He got rid of his opponents, and uh, in 1991, he emerged as the ELF was driven from the field by a joint operation between the ELF, EPLF, which he formed later, and the Tigray People's Liberation Front in 1981. So he, he became a disputed, uh, an undisputed leader of the revolution, and then he became the undisputed leader of Eritrea in 1991. And uh, in 2000, when this war started between TPLF and the Eritrean, so senior members of the EPLF, some of them were later uh, Minister of uh, Defense, Minister of Marine Resources, Minister of Interior, and so on, they started to challenge him that uh, he got uh, into this war and he didn't uh, manage this war properly. That is why the TPLF was able to control large swaths of the uh, Eritrean territory. And uh, when they challenged him in 2001, in uh, September 18, 2001, just, just about uh, seven days after the um, September 11, 
when the world was more uh, focused on what happened on September 11 and so on, we arrested all these people and their whereabouts are unknown until today. Uh, so he's a, a despot. Um, he, he's almost now, it is a one man show. He, he rules, um, a full fledged dictator who has been at war with all the neighbors, with Sudan, with Ethiopia, even with Yemen, with Djibouti. So this is in short, uh, what Isias Afwerki is like. So Eritrea is now termed as a North Korea of, of Africa. Mainly people refer to Eritrea as a North, um, Korea of, um, of Africa. And I, and I think that is not even a fair one because North Korea is well developed. At least they have developed their military. The country is developed. But here even the youth are leaving the country at a, a very fast rate and a big rate. And so people live in the country, the youth particularly, because there is this indefinite uh, national service. They are entrenched in uh, and always the excuse is that we are at war with Ethiopia. So war is coming. And the national service was supposed to be introduced in 1994, was supposed to be for 18 months, and now it is indefinite. So many young people have drowned in the Mediterranean Sea or died in the Sahara Desert, trying to reach Israel and also trying to reach uh, Europe. So this is the state of affairs inside Eritrea at present. So let's get back to where we we left off in the the narrative here with uh, Abi and Isaias they negotiate this this deal to uh, finally settle the border dispute in 2018 2019 Abi wins the Nobel prize but as you say in your piece that there were there seemed to have been problems with that agreement that that emerged fairly early on it started to to fray can you talk a little bit about that yeah so what happened is that the agreement were more agreements between two persons, between Isias and Abi Ahmed. Actually, when Abi Ahmed got this Nobel Peace Prize, and basically, as, as I said, for ending this war with Eritrea, actually, he was preparing for another war in Ethiopia against the TPLF, because he always felt the TPLF were very dominant in Ethiopian politics, and he has uh, changed the military, the security forces, the leadership of the force, but still, uh, he felt threatened by the TPLF and Eritrea, this ECS has always had a, 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 a grudge against the TPLF because in 2000, they defeated the Eritrean, uh, army. They were about us to him. And so they both agreed, it seems, um, to finish off the TPLF once and for all. So. Problems started between the TPLF and Abiy Ahmed because most of the TPLF leaders were in Ethiopia. They went to Makale. They were stationed there. And there were disagreements about, uh, because the elections in Ethiopia was delayed, the TPLF wanted to have these elections. And the TPLF used it to say that they don't recognize the Abiy Ahmed government. He's not a person who is able to govern. And uh, Abiy Ahmed were uh, saying that... Uh, what the TPLF is doing is actually against the constitution. And so in uh, November, the 4th of November, 2020, uh, it was the time of the American elections also. Well, people were focused on the elections in the US. So the TPLF attacked the, the Northern Front, which was in based in Tigray, as a preemptive move because they saw that uh, attack by Abiy Ahmed was imminent. And most of the forces of Ethiopia were actually stationed there in Tigray, because the main enemy then was Eritrea. So when they attacked this one, Abiy declared war on Tigray on the 4th of November, and Eritrean forces uh, joined this fight against the TPLF, and both the Serbian army and also the Amhara militias uh, and the Serbian army committed a lot of atrocities which have been reported by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and others. A lot of atrocities were committed, rape, extrajudicial killings, destruction of property, looting of property, even destruction of farmlands. And uh, so uh, this continued until... Uh, and so Ethiopia said at first, Abiy Ahmed said, 
this was just a limited military incursion, which its aim is to have law and order in Tigray, and that he will finish this war in two weeks' time. So by almost, um, yeah, this day, almost, uh, then he, say, he declared in two weeks' time, he said, well, mission accomplished like that of George Bush, and the TPLF have become just like uh, powder blowing into the air, and we are finished with them. But in six months' time, in June 2021, the TPLF regained their power and made a major uh, attack on the Ethiopian army. So the Ethiopian army had to leave Mekele in June 2021. And so they captured Mekele. And when he withdrew his forces from Mekele, the capital of Tigray, he didn't inform the Eritrean forces who were fighting with him. And so the Eritreans felt betrayed by that. It was the beginning of the problems with them. And then Abi was under pressure of, from, for example, Eritrea had lived under sanctions for 10 years from 2009 to 2018. And they operate clandestine operations and so on. And uh, they were able to manage this. But of course, having a country with 100 million uh, people that is not uh, easy to go the Eritrean way. So Abi, under pressure from the Western countries, allowed investigation into the war crimes. He allowed uh, humanitarian help to go into uh, Tigray. He allowed journalists to go into Tigray, which the Eritreans didn't want because they always operated in the dark. For example, no journalist is allowed in Eritrea. There is nothing. There is only one narrative, one TV, one newspaper. And so they were not happy about this. But then they started another war in 2022, again to defeat the TPLF once and for all. And this continued for several months, but it didn't result in the defeat of the TPLF. So under pressure also from the international community, there were peace talks in Pretoria and a peace agreement was signed between Abiy and the TPLF, which ended the war in Tigray. By this time, the Eritrean forces had occupied large parts of Tigray. And so the, the Eritrean forces, Eritrea, and the Amhara forces that was allied with them was, were not party of this agreement. So they felt completely betrayed by Abiy. And this worsened the, 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 the problems between Abiy and um, Eritrea. So, uh, when, so during this implementation of this peace agreement, the Eritrean troops, uh, still occupy some parts of Tigray. They refused to leave Tigray. They left from most parts, but they occupy the border areas. Like there are 44 districts. Can I, can I ask you about that? Because the, the, the reason for Eritrea to, to enter the war was there any, design on, you know, permanently occupying these border regions? Was it purely about kind of working out retribution against the TPLF or were there, were there other reasons for Isaias to, to just come into the, the conflict on uh, Abiy Ahmed's side? No, the main reason was just to, to finish off the TPLF. And that was Isaias's war. It's not the Eritrean people's war. And He's a man known for uh, revenge, uh, very revengeful. And so he wanted to finish the TPLF and the Tigray region, which has been marginalized, have seen quite a lot of development when the EPRDF took power from 91 to 2018. And a lot of factories were built, uh, lives improved in Tigray and so on. So they wanted on a spree of destroying everything in Tigray, the factories, looting the factories, looting the, uh, the, uh, the weapons, etc. And, um, as they are accused, both the Ethiopian forces, the Amhara forces and the Eritrean forces of, uh, using rape as a weapon, using food hunger as also a weapon of, uh, uh, of war. So basically it was, they just wanted to finish the TPLF because he felt like their presence was a threat to his rule in Eritrea. And when Abiy signed this Pretoria agreement, it was clear that the TPLF was not finishing. 
it is still there it has been of course um, damaged uh, uh, it is influence reduced but still it had a fighting power the leadership were there uh, most of them were still available and they could also uh, cause a problem for the Eritrean uh, state so the Amharas also during this fighting the Amharas occupied parts of Tigray which is called Western Tigray by uh, by Tigray and called um, uh, Tigray by the Amhara because the Amharas in 1991 when Ethiopia uh, underwent this federation uh, and, and in 1994 there was a constitution where ethnic federalism was introduced and based on land these regions were formed and uh, this part of western Tigray uh, the Tigrayans said most of them speak Tigrinya so they should be with Tigray and the Amhara thought because the TPLF have uh, the power now that they have taken this one and it's a very fertile area which gives the TPLF, we gave the TPLF access to the Sudan and a very fertile uh, area in, in the region. So they retook during this uh, offensive, Eritrean and Ethiopian offensive against the TPLF. They retook this Western Tigray. They retook also uh, Southern Tigray and they are still occupying it uh, at present. And the Implementation of the Pretoria Agreement was derailed because Eritrea still occupies parts of Tigray, uh, and the Amharas are in some parts of the constitutionally Tigray uh, up to 2018, and they are supported by Eritrea uh, during uh, this uh, period. And now, when Abi in uh, April this year, he said he will disarm. First of all, during the war, he made a call to arms. So everybody who was able, body to carry an arm was invited. Militias were invited. Everybody was invited. So the Amharas contributed quite substantial number of forces to this war with the TPLF. And now they felt, they felt themselves betrayed when Abi signed this war and they felt an existential threat from the TPLF. And the Tigrayans and Amharas always have had competition among them. They were the dominant rulers in northern Ethiopia for a quite a long uh, time. And so Abi then said he wants to dismantle these special forces because every region had a special force. And he started with the Amharas and he said he will um, uh, dismantle, I uh, will take all the armies from these special forces and Amhara militias. And then the Amharas um, saw this as a threat to them. And they are fighting now against the, the Ethiopian government, the central federal government. And it is a, a big fighting going on. I mean, the Ethiopian army uses drones, aerial bombardment, heavy weapons. So in the, in the start, the Amharas controlled the main cities. They released prisoners from inmates from prisoners. Uh, and now they are more into the uh, surrounding areas. They even retook some of the towns. And quite a very big war is going on now in the Amhara region. And it is believed that the Eritrea is supporting the Amharas. And also there is another simmering conflict that has been going on in Ethiopia, in Oromia, which is the biggest uh, group in ethnic group in Ethiopia, about 35%. The Amhara make about 25%. So uh, the Oromo Liberation Army is fighting inside Oromia. And this war has been going on for five years with very little attention uh, from the international uh, community. So Ethiopia at present is really a mess. And there then are ethnic tensions in other parts. So since Abi came to power, the ethnic tensions among different ethnic groups have really escalated. So with this background, then Abi says uh, he made a speech to the parliament. He was clandestinely having meetings uh, almost two years ago with journalists one time, with um, businessmen and so on, saying that uh, Ethiopia should have an access to the sea. But this became public only recently, in October 13, because uh, Ethiopian TV aired a pre-recorded uh, meeting with the parliament where Abi said that having access to the rest is an existential matter to Ethiopia. It could 
uplift it or just send it into oblivion. So when he said this, the problems then escalated between Eritrea and Ethiopia. And that is where we are now. Has this been a, a recurring thing? Is this something that Abi has particularly, you know, brought to to the fore? I mean, obviously Ethiopia hasn't had access, direct access to the Red Sea for decades. Uh, but is this is this something that Ethiopian leaders have talked about in the past that Abi has kind of picked up on, or is he, you know, kind of newly stressing this as a as a national priority? The Ethiopians uh, actually had access to the Red Sea only when they controlled Eritrea. And that is between 1952 to 1921, 39 years. Of course, he makes claims which goes something like 3,000 years. There was no Eritrea, no Ethiopia. There was this Aksumite civilization, which was partly in Eritrea, partly in Tigray. And uh, Ethiopians were not really happy with the independence of Eritrea. Most of the Ethiopians, while the TPLF was firm on this, and uh, they said the Eritreans had fought for their independence and we don't want any more fighting. So they uh, supported Eritrea's independence. But most of the populace in Ethiopia, particularly in the Amharas, were not happy with Eritrea's independence because they saw they have lost two ports, the port of Masawa and the port of Asa, which is more close to the southern, uh, the southern tip of Eritrea, close to Ethiopia. And... Uh, during this period, uh, as I said, 1952 to 19, uh, actually to 1998, until the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia started, uh, Ethiopia was using this as a port. And then when this uh, border war started, the TPLF or the EPRDF said that a port is just a market. You can shop it wherever you go. So they made an agreement with Djibouti. And because Ethiopia is a big country, I mean, one port does not really serve all these countries. So you need one port from the south, one from near the center, and so on. So they negotiated, and uh, they were using this uh, Djibouti uh, for years until 2018, until recently, until now, they use this Djibouti port. And actually, during this TPLF period, Ethiopia had a double-digit figure in terms of development without the port. So they really proved to Ethiopians that the port was not really a problem. So what Abi is telling them now is that he has a lot of problems. Um, the Amhara rebellion, the Oromo rebellion, his dictations between Somali regional state and the Afar state, problems in Benishan Gumbus where there is this uh, Jared Dam and so on. So some say it is just he wants to distract the people of Ethiopia from their current problems. and uh, But I mean, he's known also to, to talk peace while he prepares for war. This is exactly what he did during the Tigray war. He was saying, we'll never attack Tigray. Tigray is an integral part of Ethiopia and so on. But he did this. And then also he's an, um, um, uh, an evangelist and a sort of, a, well, uh, evangelist, uh, and he believes that God is with him. That is what he was saying in the war with Tigray, etc., that Ethiopia will always win because Jesus is with us, and so we will win. So he thinks he has this divine power helping him, and he said in the beginning, in 2018, when he came to power, actually his mother told him when he was seven years old that he will be the eighth king of Ethiopia. And he said from day one, he was from day year seven, he was working for this project that he will be like this. He, he believed in it, and he worked it. Uh, on it, and this is what he publicly said, and he repeats from time to time. So he feels this had divine power, but also now we have also another uh, uh, dimension, which is the regional powers who have started to come up in the Middle East, in the neighboring Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, and so on. So the UAE had a base in Assab port while they were fighting the Houthi rebels in Yemen. So they could bomb uh, from Assab to the southern uh, Yemen. And this continued for some time. They were in very good terms with Eritrea, but that didn't work well. So now uh, the UAE has become a staunch supporter of Abi. And just like the relationship between Isias and uh, Abi, the relationship is between Mohammed bin Zayed and Abi, uh, more than a two-state relationship. And there are 
speculation is that the United Arab Emirates, which they want to control the whole ports. They have been trying to get ports in Sudan, in Somaliland, in Somalia. Through so this abyss project, they want to control in the port in the Red Sea also. These are just the speculations, but it is believed that maybe uh, the UAE might be uh, supporting Abi in this project. And now uh, Eritrea is becoming more closer to uh, Saudi Arabia because now Saudi Arabia and UAE are competing who is the regional power. Saudi Arabia feels with its resources and population and so on. It should be the regional power and every company should have its regional office in, in Saudi Arabia, not in the UAE. So uh, competition. So this also plays as a factor into, into this. So taking this all into consideration, he wants to rely on the Ethiopian people. He thinks he can win the Amharas uh, or all those who feel they were unrightly lost uh, Eritrea and lost the, the, the ports. And so he could do something like he has done in the fighting with Tigray. And uh, the prospect of a war seems uh, plausible because now, uh, since he aired this in October 13 in the TV, the Serbian media has been just working on this, mobilizing people that our natural border is Eritrea and we have to regain what we have lost. Even some of them have gone as far as uh, devising some engineering projects saying why instead of going to the Red Sea, why don't we bring it, we make a tunnel and bring the Red Sea to Ethiopia and so on. So there are so many wild speculations going on in Ethiopia. Hello, Prestige Heads. Danny here to tell you about this great product that I've actually been using for the past several months, and that's Aura Digital Frames. Now, many of us today are forced to move around the country to go where our lives take us, and that's true for me too. This has made it unsurprisingly somewhat difficult to stay in touch with family members, but Aura Digital Frames has really come to the rescue, especially since I had a baby. I'm able to send my parents and other family members constant updates about my kid's life, which of course allows them to feel more closely connected to both me and more important for them, more closely connected to him. And for those worried about the fact that Aura Digital Frames is a tech adjacent gift, don't worry because it's so easy to start using. I can upload photos right from my phone in just a click. It'll even pair photos together for me. And happily, there's no memory cards, there's no USBs, nothing like that is required. See why Aura was named the number one digital frame by Wirecutter, the strategist, and Wired. So with Aura, give the perfect gift this holiday. Visit AuraFrames.com today and get $30 off their best-selling frames with the code PRESTIGE. These frames sell out quickly, though, so get yours before they're gone. That's A U. R-A-Frames.com with the promo code PRESTIGE. And as always, terms and conditions apply. That, I guess, leads me into my next question, which you, you talked about uh, Abi as, as somebody who sort of talks peace while he's preparing for war. His rhetoric on this seems to be markedly different depending on what audience he's talking to. So if it's a more international context, he, he expresses this desire for a port, but says, oh, you know, we could lease it or we could come to some peaceful arrangement. We have no design, no interest in, you know, going to war uh, over this. But but it, sa- it seems like uh, in other maybe more private venues, he's talking more militantly about what, you know, he might wind up doing. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the the different faces that he seems to put on here when he talks about this issue? So far, he has said publicly, I mean, he uh, he said, of course, this is an existential problem. So we, if we don't do it today, our kids will do it because we are like in a geographical prison. We can't live like this. And it is like telling the Ethiopians all their problems would be resolved if they get access to the port. But in reality, during the time when they had this access to Asab and and um, Masawa, the two ports of Eritrean ports, there was this Eritrean liberation movement, which cost Ethiopia quite a lot economically. And there was this Tigrian problem. So these things didn't go away. So what Abi says now is that he's trying to negotiate a deal, give, for example, some shares in Ethiopian airlines to Eritrea in exchange for a port, or, for example, from the Jared Dam, uh, give some shares 
And uh, when in diplomatic terms, when he talks, he's about um, sharing. But Ethiopia has already built a naval base. It's not about access to the sea. Access to the sea is through international uh, uh, regulation as law of the sea. You can have access to the sea. I mean, you use the sea, you, you lose the port and you pay fees for it. And it could be uh, done without any problems. But he has built a naval base and uh, a naval force. And he has wants to have a naval base. And uh, when he declares this, like, for example, uh, publicly he didn't mention Eritrea, also from the history, etc. He was referring to Eritrea. So Somalia reacted, Djibouti reacted to this. Actually, the Eritrean response was very muted. So diplomatically, he says these things. And, uh, but in other forms, he has said very clearly, we can use force. And also there is this problem, this Amhara problem, uh, who are supported by Eritrea now. And he, if he wants to end this uh, Amhara problem, one of the things he has to do is to seal the border with Eritrea. So the Amharas won't get any uh, military supplies, etc. And the Eritrean dictator is, yes, is very good at proxy wars. He has been playing proxy wars in the region for a long time. And so he will exploit this Amhara uh, issue actually to drain Abiy uh, during this uh, process. So as you mentioned, he diplomatically says um, we can make a deal. It's about, but when you want to have a Navy, uh, then there is no country that would allow you to have and navy on its land, I mean. So if a war were to break out, we've, you've, you've talked about some of the domestic pressures that Abi may be trying to to deal with. Certainly he'll have to worry about uh, Amhara militias as a, as a threat, uh, a greater threat perhaps in the event of a war with Eritrea. But it seems like he's responding to a lot of these uh, ethnic conflicts with this idea of focusing everybody's attention on this quest for a port. What's the domestic political situation in Eritrea? How, how might that be? Uh, or how, how is that responding to uh, this threat from potential threat from Ethiopia? Or if there is a, you know, if, if this does advance to a war, what do you what would you expect to see uh, in Eritrea in response? Yeah, uh, from the information we have is that both sides are preparing for war. The returns are mobilizing people. Uh, and always they have wanted you to keep this Eritrean news engaged that there is a threat, a foreign threat coming to you. So you have always to be uh, ready and for it. So I think domestically in Eritrea, this will embolden Isias uh, in a way because Eritreans have paid dearly for, uh, for their independence and they wouldn't accept Eritrea being taken again by Ethiopia. So definitely they will fight. They may fight even with the side of uh, Asias uh, in this war, if a war really breaks uh, out. So that actually he is in a way extending the lifeline of Asias in, in Eritrea because he will be bothered. And uh, I, as I've said in the piece, I mean, if you see it logically, both countries are not really prepared for war. They have lost heavily in in uh, in the war with Tigray. Something like the military in Ethiopia, it is reported that they have lost something like 250,000, 300,000 uh, soldiers. They may have lost the best men they had, uh, even the military-led leadership uh, they had. So you wouldn't see it from a logical person to go to war at this time. Eritrea also had quite a big of big losses. But uh, everything in Eritrea is clandestine, is secret, so we don't know really much how much uh, uh, the Eritrean losses were in this war. So both are coming from this war. So logically, you wouldn't expect them to go to war. But as I've said, both Isias and Abi are just unpredictable. And also any, any move from one side, even a small mistake, can break out into a war. Like what happened in 1998 was that the Eritreans occupied a small village called Badimme, which they claimed it was theirs. And then the Siobhanes reacted, and this one went to a fearing. They said the Eritreans should withdraw. They refused to withdraw. And then this one it escalated immediately into a devastating war. So 
any mistake by any of the sides could could uh, could uh, could break. So the outcome of such a war would be devastating for both of them. Maybe both of them may lose their uh, positions. Abiy may lose because he has lost the main support base for him was the Amharas. Actually, he has problems with Orom- with Oromos because most of them, there is a very wide repression going on in Oromia at present. The support he has there is very, very little. Although the Amhara believes this government is an Oromo-oriented government and they wanted to um, to do away with the Amhara dominance that has been in Ethiopia for a long time. So both of them could lose their positions in an, a long term in the war. And also there are many countries in the region who would like to see Asias gone because he has been a troublemaker in this in this uh, region, and he has been shifting alliances with uh, different countries. And he is a survival strategist, and he has been able to survive this long. He's the longest serving dictator in the region at present, in the Horn of Africa and the Middle East region. So uh, to conclude, and this kind of takes us uh, away a bit from the potential for a, for a new Eritrean Ethiopian war, but you've, you know, the backdrop to this is just. Uh, an unrelenting series of devastating conflicts in Ethiopia between Ethiopia and Eritrea and other, you know, in Tig- Tigray in particular, or Tigray in particular, but also in other parts of Ethiopia, there have been uh, accusations of uh, credible, I, I, I think, of, of mass atrocities by Amhara forces, by Eritrean forces, by the TPLF when it's, it, it, you know, moved outside of Tigray. Uh, is there any effort to your knowledge to to try and account for war crimes if you know i i would say to hold you know uh to to get some justice and accountability for these things but uh that even seems like a you know even more distant prospect but just to sort of uh catalog or account for the the number of uh, atrocities that have been committed across these conflicts is anybody in the region doing anything or trying to do anything like that? Unfortunately, uh, there was this um, Serbia investigative uh, team assigned by the UN, and it was dismantled just a um, couple of months ago. Like uh, the Western countries, um, the EU, the US, and Abi said he was doing something like transitional justice. I mean, you are a perpetrator and you can't have run of a justice uh, system. It is not acceptable. And Abi has always been threatening the Europeans or the Americans, particularly the Europeans, because it is a country of 110 million. And if it breaks down, then all these uh, millions of people would be going to Europe. And the Europeans are really more interested in not many immigrants coming to them than anything else. So it right, looks, it's sort of like stability above all, right? Yes. For the for the West, I think here. Yes. So it looks like they have done away with um, accountability. That is really very sad because these things will be repeated. We see it also in Sudan, in Darfur, in uh, uh, 2003, atrocities were committed, and also they have just uh, run away with it. And also they are doing the same. The same atrocities are continuing. So it's unfortunate, but I think this this war could be averted. I mean, the last thing that this region needs is really uh, a war. And so the African Union, IGAD, uh, even Blinken had um, uh, had said that he had urged Ethiopia and Eritrea to refrain from provocations and to respect uh, the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the countries and so on. So I hope the international community will come before this develops into into war, and it could be averted. Then. Sure, sure. One, uh, my my one final question, and and this would you know this it gets at the issue of, uh, you know, this is the last thing that this region needs. The humanitarian situation in Tigray, Tigray in particular, but uh, more broadly across the region, with you know in terms of drought and and hunger, and um, there's been interruptions in U.S. and and UN food assistance. As I said, particularly in Tigray, you know, because of the war and the after effects of it, can you talk a little bit about that 
that particular piece of this and, and you know, how dire it is right now uh, and how much worse it could get in the event of a, a new conflict? I think there is a dire humanitarian situation. There are something like 1.2 million displaced people. And because uh, USAID and WFP have suspended full distribution in Ethiopia the last few months because of uh, abuse in the food distribution system in Ethiopia. So people are dying of hunger, particularly in Tigray and other areas also. The, the other areas of like the Amhara region and the Afar region has been also affected by the war uh, during uh, this 2020, 2021, particularly 22. And uh, uh, there are like displaced people. And I was listening today to the the uh, the uh, interim uh, administration in Tigray. Uh, Getacho Asafa is leading this interim administration in Tigray today and that they, even the budget allocated is by Ethiopia, they have received only a small portion of it. So they couldn't pay even salaries, enough salaries for, for people. So, and there are people who have been displaced from hundreds of thousands from Western Tigray and Southern Tigray who are still living in um, schools in other places. And so the school system have not been operating for the last three years. And there was a recent uh, account also that the, some of the doctors are leaving Tigray now because of the dire situation in the country and there is no enough medicine. And, uh, and the country is in, in turmoil in general in, in Ethiopia. And also now there are, because of this El Nino, uh, there are quite severe floods in some areas in the Somali region, in the Afar region, in Ethiopia. There has been also drought in Oromia, in these regions. And because of the fighting in the Amhara region, actually the stable crop in Ethiopia is stiff. And it was the Oromia region and the Amhara region which really uh, supplied most of this uh, stable product in Ethiopia. And now the farmers have not been able even to harvest their crops. Some of the harvests have been because uh, bombs have fallen into this harvest and it has burned it. So it's really a very difficult situation for all the people in this region, Amhara region, Asfar and Tigray in particular. I think, unfortunately, there's no uh, way to end that on a happy note. We'll have to leave it there. But uh, Mohammed Kher Omer, I want to thank you again so much for coming on the program. This has been, uh, I think, really illuminating about the uh, desperate conditions in this region and the possibility that they could get much worse. Uh, in the near future. So thank you again so much. The piece again is Our Ethiopian Eritrea on the Path to War. Uh, it's at Foreign Policy. We'll have a link in the show description. But again, Mohammed, thank you so much. Thank you also for giving me the chance to address your readers. Thank you very much.